I'm Justin McRoberts, and you are listening to the Title Pending Audio Series, a collection of readings focused on moments in my own creative history that I hope shed an inspired light on yours. Chapter 3. Listen to, read, watch, and see better art. You and I are part of a long, rich history of art makers just by wading into the stream of creative work. We share space with the likes of Picasso, Rothko, Rembrandt, Dostoevsky, Updike, McCarthy, Dylan, Waits, Cash, Shakur, The Stones, The Beatles, etc. Knowing that we have a place in that history ought to be inspiring. As a musician, that has meant I can't just listen only to what I prefer. I shouldn't just look at what makes me happy. Instead, I need to be a student of the discipline and genre that I work in. If you dislike someone's work, and you're mystified by its popularity or impact, consider asking people who dig it why they dig it. Don't allow your preferences to keep you from learning from art outside of those preferences. Art in niche markets, like the oddly and wrongly stylized Christian marketplace, often end up in cul-de-sacs of mediocrity because reference points for greatness are limited by genre and narrow preference. One of my favorite performing songwriters is Jeremy Enoch who fronted the band Sunday Day Real Estate. Both as a solo artist and as a primary songwriter for Sunday Day Real Estate, Enoch is widely recognized as a relatively groundbreaking artist, at least through the 90s. His work paved the way for most of what is now considered emo, including bands like Dashboard Confessional. When asked about his musical influences, Enoch often points at bands like U2, The Beatles, or Nick Drake, in later interviews I've read during his solo career, he mentions his love for more dramatic ballad rock like Journey or Queen. It's a safe bet that many, if not most, of Enix listeners were not also fans of general market successes like U2 or Queen, particularly beyond the genre he was helping to shape, was a key to making great music. And this takes me to a similar thought. Learn to appreciate and love art you can't make. At a pivotal point in the writing of my first book, I spent some time at the Phillips Gallery in Washington, D.C. Along with many other great works, the Phillips Gallery hosts a collection of pieces by Mark Rothko, whose work I greatly admire. I stood in the Rothko room for what was probably 15 minutes, though it felt like a week. I was entranced, and something about that time shook loose parts of my writing process that had been stuck for weeks. If you're like me, You loved art before you started making it. In fact, your love of art is, in large part, probably what led you to start making art of your own. I think that ought to always be the case, that my love for art should remain close to the heart of my creative process. Which leads to something of a dilemma. As much as I enjoy music, I have a tendency to think and talk shop about music, meaning my love and appreciation often take a backseat to analysis and critique. Well, that's harder to do when I'm looking at work I know I can't make, work by artists like Rothko or Vonnegut. Because I cannot do what they do, I can simply take it in and enjoy it as a viewer and a reader. I can be inspired. It's easy to fall out of love with art if I'm constantly in the grind of making it. One way to reawaken that inspired love is to step away from our own creative process for a bit. Another way as is discussed later in this book, is to make something outside your primary discipline or craft. I would add to that list the joyful discipline of listening to, reading, or seeing art you know you can't make. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Title Pending Audio Series. If you've enjoyed listening and you'd like to take another step or two in the direction of your own creative process, navigate your way to yourcreativeprocess.info. And there you'll find an online course I've designed for you.